Postmodernism is represented by hyperreality, which is characterized by ever increasing absurdity and nihilism. Its ultimate goal is to achieve completely unfettered sensory gratification. In the pseudo devotional sphere, it also promotes this notion but it does so in a somewhat different manner compared to the Vikarmic Western culture as that is what is to be expected. Postmodernism exploits the inventions of the previous modern era for purposes they were not originally intended for. Its hyper-reality encompasses both immorality and nihilism, and it operates within the mode of ignorance. It promotes the idea that everything is relative and that there's no absolute truth. Particularly within the so-called devotional sphere of hyperreality, a unique deviation exists, which is undoubtedly present in the postmodern concoction known as Ritvik. In order to gain popularity, in a descending Western octave, everything conducive to the warped minds of the Vox Populi, and there are plenty of so-called devotees who are part of that. Everything is jacked up, made artificially special, embellished to extremes, promoted with excess and promoted with bad logic and made sensually appealing as can be imaginable. This description certainly applies to the Ritvik concoction and its many features. Now, hyperreality is not limited to popularity. Hyperreality is now embedded in Western culture to such an extent that it cannot in many, if not most cases, even be noticed for what it actually is. Anything presented that is not permeated by hyperreality is automatically rejected as dull and uninteresting. In the vulgar, the karmic culture, hyperreality thrives on useless factoids, the vast majority of them meant to divert attention from that which is or should be, important or even essential. Ritvik is not at all devoid of such vulgarity. This is particularly the case from the worst of the fanatics who attack anyone who exposes it. They divert people from the truth via their own brand of hyperreality. Part of their shtick is exemplified with their quote-unquote Back to Prabhupada magazine. There are many other examples of absurdity which their most degraded proponents utilize via argumentum ad absurdum. Hyperreality thrives on a display of deception, misinformation, relativity, rumor, and innuendo. Not all Ritviks engage in these negative principalities, but some of them do, one in particular. Is there a need to name him? For those who have not followed the scene over the years, they may prefer that he actually be named. However, most of you listening to this presentation are not in that category. Of the Ritvik haters and the Ritvik lovers who are reading and are listening to this article, you all know who is being referred to here. He is the attack dog, affording the other Ritviks to play good cop to his bad cop in their vitiated argumentation. However, there are quite a few Ritviks who wish that he was not part of their movement because he is giving it a bad reputation by his mudslinging, by his lies, 
his distortions, his straw man attacks, ad nauseum, he is, without question, incorrigible. Because Ritviks will never be able to secure a strong governing body, that attack dog will continue to use the I equals me illusion to propagate the so-called success of what he is preaching, although individually he has accomplished almost nothing at all. The plural of that noun, Ritviks, is employed for a reason, because the Ritvik movement is highly centrifugal and not at all united. As could only be expected, there are reasons for this. Have you ever noticed the proclivity of many Ritviks to toss the name of Jesus into their ordinary mix? This gives you about another hint that their whole concoction is crypto-Christianity. I have not seen the name of Jesus anywhere on the list of the great Acharyas constituting our line of disciplic succession. Or for that matter, any of the other Sampradayas authorized as the only means for deliverance, according to Padma Purana, in this age. Never mind. They do not know Jesus Christos. Though they try to use him for their frivolous purposes, nor does he approve of them, nor does he even know them. Ritvik's evidence to establish itself is so weak that it can hardly even be called evidence at all. The original Ritvik proposed a version, but that proposal was merged into oblivion decades ago. The IRM started out as the ISKCON reform movement but now they've changed their tune to the ISKCON Revival, and that allows them to keep the acronym. How convenient. You have different other versions to pick and choose from in Ritvik. All of these versions fit into the category of hyperreality because all of them afford the faithlessness which covertly undergirds the whole concoction. Such faithlessness disguised as devotion to a Prabhupada, who does not exist as advertised by these fools. Such faithlessness opens the door to all kinds of sense gratification to be enjoyed by such loose, so-called followers. Now, you have hard Ritvik as one of your choices. Hard Ritvik postulates that for at least the duration of the age of Kali, Prabhupada remains the only Diksha Guru for the whole age. By the way, that's 427,000 more years. Of course, as of November 15, 1977, Prabhupada no longer could be a Diksha Guru for any newcomer, but Hard Rithik opines otherwise. Hyperreality is prone to fanaticism, and Hard Rithik is certainly as fanatical as it gets. Hard Ritvik, without any strong evidence whatsoever, says that there will be no more Uttama Adhikaris. But Hard Ritvik has competition. There is Soft Ritvik, for example. Soft Ritvik postulates that Ritvik, this current concoction, is the interim arrangement until the next Mahabhagavat manifests. Both hard Ritvik and soft Ritvik completely ignore and disregard Vaishnava tradition as a standard. That the guru must be physically manifest is integral to that standard, known as Shishtatra. This Shishtatra tradition has been extant for millennia, but these fanatical, dangerous and deviant Ritviks completely eschew it. They want a cheap and loose imitation process in order to attract numbers. They believe that numbers prove their legitimacy, and they believe that Prabhupada defied all Vaishnava tradition when he established his movement in the mid-60s in the West. However, he did 
recognize the law of physical guru. Consider this room conversation on May 23rd, 1974 in Rome, Italy. O'Grady, the problem is to find this friend. The problem is to find this spiritual master. Prabhupada, no, there is no problem. The problem is if you are sincere. So if you are sincere, then God will give you a spiritual master. If he knows that now you are sincere, then he will give you a spiritual master. Oh, Grady. Okay, thank you. That I know. Prabhupada, if God sees that you are sincere, he will give you a spiritual master who can give you protection. He will help you from within and without. Without, in the physical form of a spiritual master and within as the spiritual master within the heart. Ask yourself this question. Why would Prabhupada go out of his way here in this room conversation to actually state, quote, the physical spiritual master, unquote. Everybody in his movement knew this rule. It was one of the bedrocks that differentiated his version of theism from so-called Christianity. It had been established by all Vaishnava tradition for millennia. He did specifically mention it because possessing Tri Kalagya, he knew that in the future there could be fools, or perhaps he knew that there would be fools, trying to break this immutable law of disciplic succession, and that's exactly what went down in the form of Ritvik in the very late 80s and early 90s. The Ritvik clown car is a highly centrifugal movement. So much so that you almost have to say Ritvik movements in the plural when conversing about it. Indeed, it is assuredly the case that it has lost converts due to their inability to determine which of the Ritvik alternatives offered is actually the one that Prabhupada allegedly wanted. We have already discussed hard Ritvik and soft Ritvik. There is little room for compromise between them but the divisions go far beyond that. When the Ritvik Acharya performing the ceremony, allegedly performing it, on behalf of the Yajamana, what is the status of that Yajamana after receiving the Ritvik Beach? Some of these so-called Ritvik Acharyas have opined that he then becomes equal, an equal god-brother immediately. In other words, the Ritvik Acharya has no responsibility to the Yajamana after the bananas and rice have been tossed into the fire, the name given, and then some ceremonial niceties actuated in the aftermath. Other Ritviks opine that the Ritvik Acharya is obliged to accept seva from his newly initiated disciple on behalf of Prabhupada. That Yajamana is to consider the Ritvik to be, in a sense, like Prabhupada to some extent. After all, he is known as a Ritvik Acharya. So which is it? The original Ritvik proposal was that the ISKCON GBC, and only the governing body, could determine who could be Ritviks conducting these ceremonies on behalf of a non-manifest guru. That theory made the original 11 appointed Ritviks. They were Ritviks only to be expanded on by the GBC in due course of time. That was the proposal, but it merged into oblivion very soon because the governing body rejected it, root and branch. Aside from the fact that no one today is a Ritvik because the Ritvik function in relation to Prabhupada, came to a permanent end on November 15, 1977. Aside from this fact, how do the current Ritvik groups determine 
who is qualified to carry out their concocted initiations. How to determine which so-called Ritviks are now qualified? Do all the groups recognize all of the Ritviks from the other Ritvik groups? Then again, another splinter group of Ritviks has proposed that all of them are actually gurus but they can only be recognized as gurus outside of the established ISKCON temples. Otherwise, newcomers who come to the various well-established ISKCON centers from decades ago must accept Prabhupada as their Diksha guru if they get initiated there in that temple. If they, however, become attracted to a Ritvik Acharya, one who has established his own center in the field, then... He is actually their Diksha Guru when he performs the colorful ceremony. Again, this proposal could not take root because so-called ISKCON has rightly condemned Ritvik as a dangerous deviation and it did not cooperate with it. That could change at any time, however. Where did Prabhupada give any specifics as to how the Ritvik concoction was to be carried out? Nowhere, because he never authorized it. He could have very easily done so. Here, let me give you an example of what he could have said, which would have established this wrong idea for a posterity. Quote, he could have said, From this time onward, I am the only Diksha Guru for my future disciples, including when I depart this world and leave the scene. Unquote. In merely one sentence, he could have established it. He didn't, because he wouldn't, because the whole scheme is unauthorized according to all Vaishnava tradition and disciplic successions. The whole idea is ridiculous. If he had established it, he could have, and would have, been asked some questions as to how to carry it out. Such specific answers would have made everything clear and there would have only been one Ritvik way. He did not, of course, because this concoction was never for a moment either his desire or his vision. Aside from that, no genuine spiritual master could ever make such a statement or try to establish such an unauthorized method for carrying out future initiations. Ironically, many who reject Ritvik propaganda falsely believe that Prabhupada could have established such a system for future initiations if he had wanted to do so. No, he could not have done so. No guru, no legitimate guru, can claim that he is the last guru in any line, or any branch even. Any so-called guru who does should immediately be rejected as a charlatan, Ritvik is all hyper-reality, just another make-show. Of course, so-called ISKCON is as well. What is little understood is that the Ritvik concoction came just at the right time to bail out so-called ISKCON, which was floundering badly in the late 80s and early 90s. Ritvik had some powerful pundits, to be sure. One of them in particular has written extensively to expose so-called ISKCON and its narrative. His writings are potent, but most unfortunately his writings are also contaminated, as they almost all are vitiated by Ritvik Vad. This is exactly what the vitiated GBC required. It came in the nick of time. They can now dismiss all the unmasking and exposures in the Ritvik propaganda against them with one fell swoop by marrying those two Ritvik and Upasiddhanta. Not only is Ritvik an apostasy, it's also a heresy. As such, air quotes ISKCON leaders can claim, and most of their followers will believe them, that all of the other revelations about the corruption in so-called ISKCON must be false because all of them are linked to the Ritvik heresy.
it is not necessarily the fact that the air quotes ISCON leaders will use such blunt language because those who are caught in its wheelhouse are already captive by the institution to greater or lesser extents. In effect, they are preached to that. They just toss out everything which is preached by the prominent Ritviks, one in particular, because if there was any truth to any of it, then the Ritvik Apasadanta could not be a part of it. So since Ritvik Apasadanta is a part of it, all the rest also has to be false. So it's a simple thing that they get preached to about. Is that bad logic? Of course it is. But air quotes ISKCON followers and fanatics are easily captivated by any bad logic that is accepted as dogma by that institution. Simple for the simpletons. So-called ISKCON has a foil. The foil is as compromised as it is, but it's in an entirely different category. In other words, so-called ISKCON is a semblance, an apostle of the real thing. It's an imitation school. Bogus is a $3 bill, but nevertheless a semblance. Ritvik, on the other hand, is not that. Ritvik is a false school. It is wrong from the gate. Its very foundation is not a semblance, as its process is both false and heretical. Its pundits, again, one in particular, are thus easily emasculated by the enemy because of this gigantic flaw. Please note, the Sanskrit word for flaw is dosha. That word is spoken by Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita when describing birth, death, disease, and old age. However, it is not translated as flaw in that particular translation of the verse. Instead, it is translated by Prabhupada as evil. Dosha also means evil. And this is how we should apply it in connection to the Ritvik concoction. Ritvik is not capable of producing clarity. Instead, it muddies the waters. Sure, its pundits expose so many flaws, and yes, evils, in what has transpired in so-called ISKCON for the past four-plus decades. No doubt about it. But that amounts to pouring clarified butter on ashes. Nothing could really come of it, because only the Ritvik fanatics will fully believe it. Even though the vast majority of the corruption report is true, because only those invested in the Ritvik concoction can have faith in its narrative. Lack of clarity will only produce evil results in the intermediate and in the long run. So-called ISKCON survives the fierce internecine attacks on its narrative due to the evil that it has integral to it. To top it off, the first echelon of Ritvik leaders are all, to greater or lesser extents, fanatics. Downline are sentimentalists, although in the third echelon there's plenty of fanatics. All of these people are incapable of seeing the truth of what went down and continues to go down because they almost all completely lack any development whatsoever in spiritual science. As such, the Ritviks, both the fanatics and the sentimentalists, which comprise everyone in all of the offshoots, the Ritviks are prone to swallow extremely weak evidence to back up their false claim that Prabhupada wanted a Ritvik arrangement after he left the scene. One such gem is from Prabhupada's final will and testament. Did Prabhupada dictate that will? He did not. He was in very bad shape on the material plane when it was presented to him. He did make one change to what was first offered to him. The devotees who wrote the will had a very negative bias toward Guru Kripa. 
So they left him out of it in terms of his being a trustee for any of the ISKCON centers. Prabhupada was aware of that bias and he spotted it in the document. As such, he forced a limited rewrite in a beginning section in order to give Guru Kripa trustee control of the Krishna Balaram temple complex in Raman Reiki. Aside from that omission in the first draft of the will, Prabhupada made no further suggestions. He signed off on it. In his condition, was he expected to go nitty-gritty on some remote ramification produced by Maya that could result if some section of it leaving some kind of Mayaka interpretation was in it? Of course not. He did not do that with his letters, some of which contained egregious spelling and syntax errors. And in his condition, in the middle of 1977, he was not going to do that with the will either. Every devotee genuinely initiated by Prabhupada in the 60s and early 70s knew it well that he did not have a favorable relationship with the God Brothers who were leaders of the Gaudiya Mat or Gaudi mission. Such was the case after he traveled to the West to begin his preaching mission. Virtually all of those God Brothers were against him. They were against him doing that mission and none of them helped him. What was less known is that Prabhupada did not have a very favorable relationship either with his former wife or his sons. The assets in India, especially the temple complexes, were extensive and extremely valuable. A claim could be made on them by either a section of his god brothers or by one or more of his inimical sons. This potential was foreseen by the devotees who drew up the will. All of the Indian properties were under the ultimate control of trustees. These trustees were all Prabhupada disciples, as could only be expected. As such, it was written in the will that in the future, all the trustees of the properties of Iskand, particularly in India, of course, were to be Prabhupada's initiated disciples. Most of them were still either somewhat young or having just entered middle age at that time in 1977. In the vast majority of cases, they would live for many more decades. What kind of shelf life would potential litigation from a threat of a takeover claim, either from Gaudiamut or his sons, have? The obvious answer, due to many factors, would be a very short shelf life. If an inheritance lawsuit was going to be filed on the properties by either of these inimical entities, it would have to have been actuated within the first few years after Prabhupada's disappearance. Tatvamasi. In the event of such an inheritance lawsuit, would either all or the vast majority of those trustees still be living? Of course they would. Was it Prabhupada's duty to go nitty-gritty and spot how way up the road the foolish Ritviks would misuse the clause of, quote, my initiated disciples, unquote, 12 years later in order to allege that Prabhupada established a Ritvik system into perpetuity in his will? It is utterly absurd to believe that he would have to have been expected to have done so, and he is not culpable for anything related to that. Yet, that is one of the flawed gems used by the Ritviks in order to allegedly established that Prabhupada planted something in his will, very, very covertly, in order to establish Ritvik into posterity. They claim that since all of Prabhupada's trustees listed in the will would be dead within 50 or 60 years, they claim that the will then, by asserting that trustees must be initiated disciples of Prabhupada, 
empowered future initiations by Prabhupada, as otherwise the centers would have no trustees unless future devotees could be allegedly initiated by Prabhupada. Any sane and serious transcendentalist considers such quote-unquote evidence to be nothing more than about as weak as it gets. Indeed, it is such an absurdity that most devotees who have not got suckered into the scam would dismiss it as no evidence at all. On July 9th, 1977, His Divine Grace named 11 Ritviks to conduct initiations on his behalf to conduct the ceremony for the Yajamana, who then became an initiated disciple of Srila Prabhupada. This was nothing new. It had been a system in place since 1970. Before 1970, Prabhupada had conducted these ceremonies personally. However, since the beginning of his last decade with us, he had his leading men conduct the fire sacrifice. Sometimes he was physically present on his Vyasasan watching and giving the names and the beads to his newly initiated disciples. More often, however, all of that was in a package received by the temple president or leading secretary via snail mail, and Prabhupada was not physically present while initiation formalities took place. Due to Prabhupada's illness in the first half of 1977, all initiations were curtailed. The spiritual master has to take on the sanchita karma of his newly initiated disciples, and this can lead to some suffering for him, even for the big fire that Prabhupada was. He should not have been burdened during that period of his illness. However, the stockpile of devotees requesting initiation was increasing at an alarming rate, and this was brought to his attention. Near the middle of 1977, out of his causeless mercy, he decided to once again initiate new people. Obviously, the Ritvik system would be reinstated in order to do that. It was no big deal that it was reactivated. There was nothing even remotely surprising about that. Indeed, it would have been extremely surprising if Prabhupada went back to how he personally conducted the fire sacrifices in the 60s. In his condition, there was no question that he was going to do that. A big deal, however, is made of the July 9th letter by the Ritviks. As could only be expected, they twist some things in it in order to provide so-called evidence of their concoction, and that will be described now. The word which they highlight is as follows, quote, and again, this is in the July 9th letter, 1977, this, what we're about to read. Now that Srila Prabhupada has named these representatives, temple presidents may henceforward send recommendation for first and second initiation to whichever of these 11 representatives are nearest their temple, unquote. This is generally known as the Ritvik appointment letter, which it was. Many Ritviks make it out to be a revolutionary development as if a Ritvik appointment was unprecedented. For these Ritvik pundits to do so, frankly, is just as deceptive as their, air quotes, ISKCON counterparts in the matter of spinning a narrative. The only difference, ultimately, is that both parties are spinning different false narratives, that's all. In that Ritvik appointment letter, 11 Ritviks were named. Nothing astounding there. What is mind-boggling is how the Ritvik pundits spin that one word, and the one word is, quote-unquote, henceforward, in order to eke out a bizarre, monumental, 
an unprecedented major change in the way that genuine Vaishnav initiations are to be performed and who the Diksha Guru must be for the Yajamana for posterity. The Ritviks all, and that is without exception all of them, claim that by this letter of appointment of Ritviks in July 1977, a brand new system of initiation was created for Prabhupada's branch of Lord Chaitanya's Hare Krishna movement. They marry that with the aforementioned false pretense that even the appointment of Ritviks in 1977 was new. In the folio, there are 42 other mentions of the word henceforward in Prabhupada's letters. Most of these were part of creating some improvement. When the word was applied in that way, all of these turned out to be temporary measures, which were either reversed or implemented in a different and or better way up the road. Herein, you get but another hint of how the Ritviks are incorrigible, fixed within blinders of their own making in order to allegedly prove that Prabhupada established an anti-Vedic, anti-Vaishnava system of initiation. He allegedly did so with but one word, conveniently misinterpreted in order to establish a completely new system for the rest of the age of Kali. One word in a document, a document, by the way, that Prabhupada did not even dictate, which was only meant to restart the previously well-established system of Ritviks performing fire sacrifices on his behalf, and Prabhupada is alleged to have changed the whole Sampradaya? The purpose of the letter, written by TKG, by the way, was to reinstate the Ritvik process and list the Ritviks for that time period. It was never meant to create a massive new hoax. However, that's exactly what the Ritviks use it for. It is well known that Prabhupada did not like, nor did he ever approve, changes to the tattva and siddhanta he mercifully bestowed upon us. Over the years, there were some other changes he did not approve of in terms of, there are some other changes he did approve of in terms of time, place, and circumstance adjustments. Your host speaker does not wish to waste time detailing any of those. They're sort of well known, actually. If you were part of the movement while he was with us, you probably know very well such to be the case. On the whole, however, he did not make even many of those adjustments. As far as the basic process was concerned, that was never allowed to be changed whatsoever. The Ritviks, as per their proclivity, turned this fact on its head. They claim that since Prabhupada sometimes said, quote unquote, no change, that means the Ritviks method of initiation must be continued into perpetuity how absurd this is. In mid-November 1977, there was an earth-shaking change in Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement when he departed physical manifestation. We had to adjust to that major change. Either the adjustments would be right or they would be wrong. In the case of both so-called Iskan and Ritvik, their adjustments were and remain wrong. Can you write a letter to Prabhupada and expect him to reply? Where would you mail it? What address? What country? Can you arrange for a meeting with him so that he can settle some kind of major dispute or thorny issue? You got plenty of those. Can you book a preaching engagement for him? Can you invite professors and so-called religionists to meet with him in his private room and have provocative conversations with him? The Ritviks misapply, as they do with everything, 
the principle of no change. They claim that no change means no change in Ritviks conducting initiation ceremonies on behalf of the Guru, even after he is no longer physically manifest. All of the other Sampradayas, including the Gaudiya Sampradaya, have never approved of any such concoction in the history of their lines, which dates back millennia. However, in Ritvik, it is tradition be damned. Why should Ritvik be approved now? That is a rhetorical question. Simply because Prabhupada, on a handful of occasions and in different contexts, expressed the no change principle, and then Ritvik is to be approved for that reason. Once again, the absurdity of the Ritvik's so called evidence falls light years short of what would be required in order to actually have solid evidence that Prabhupada established a new system of initiation, which he most certainly did not. Ritvik insists that initiation can only be given by an Uttama Odhikari. During his physical manifestation, Prabhupada emphasized being initiated by a Mahabhagavat. And why not? He was that and the knowledge of Krishna consciousness, including initiation into it, was brought to the West by him and Uttamadakari. He was the way, the truth, and the light. Those who came into contact with him in any way, even from a distance, should never have been encouraged by either him or anyone else to accept initiation from a Madhyamadakari, even if that Madhyam was Prabhupada's disciple and qualified. As such, there are a few statements here and there, all of which must be understood in context, meaning while he was still with us on the physical plane, the manifest plane, emphasizing the importance of initiation from an Uttama Diksha Guru because that's who Prabhupada was. Yet, Prabhupada specifically wrote and spoke that a Madhyam Odhikari can also accept disciples meaning that he can initiate them into a connection with the Guru Parampara. There are plenty of examples, and we shall be presenting four of these now. The Ritviks, absorbed as they are in bad logic, condemn the principle of a Madhyam initiating. They do so on the basis of how it is misapplied in so-called ISKCON. Since the second transformation, after the Zonal Acharya scam crashed and burned, misused it. Misuse of a great science does not render it useless. Misuse of a spiritual law does not render it useless. Misuse of a spiritual principle does not render it useless. The rascal Ritviks, in the name of Vaishnavism, have the audacity to concoct a postmodern, Western, crypto-Christian means of so-called initiation. It is nothing but a heresy, with no authorization from the previous Acharya. In doing so, they attack the principle of a Madhyam being able to carry on the line in the absence of a physically manifest Uttama Odhikari. Although this has taken place in our own Gaudiya Sampradaya, just after the disappearance of Narutama Das Thakur. The Ritviks should be flat out rejected because they reject the clear statements by Prabhupada in this connection of a Madhyam. If he receives the order being authorized to initiate, here are four of those clear statements from Easy Journey to Other Planets. Quote, Stage 13. He must not take on unlimited disciples. This means that a candidate who has successfully followed the first 12 items can also become a spiritual master himself, just as a student becomes a monitor in class with a limited number of disciples, unquote. He becomes a spiritual master. Later in the sequence, at stage 16, the advancing guru becomes completely free from lamentation. By the way, 
that is attained at Uttamadakari upon his initial entrance into Mahabhagavat realization beyond the Mahatattva. As such, this previous stage 13, obviously, is still in the Madhyam Adhikari category. How can anybody deny this? Yet the Madhyam can make a limited number of disciples. That means initiating them. He is the small fire, so he can only burn up a limited amount of Sanchita Karma from his limited number of disciples. The Uttama is the big fire, and he can take as many disciples as he wants. And then we go to the second evidence here. From Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 3, Text 21, Purport, quote, The second class devotee makes distinctions between devotees and non-devotees. The second class devotees are, therefore, meant for preaching work, and as referred to in the above verse, they must loudly preach the glories of the Lord. The second class devotee accepts disciples from the section of third class devotees or non-devotees, unquote. Accepting disciples means initiating them. The second class devotee is, of course, the Madhyam Odhikari. He initiates neophytes and those who he brings from his loud uh, preaching status up to the status from the non-devotee section to that of the neophyte. Third evidence from a room conversation in Raman Rethi on May 28, 1977, that all-important meeting with the GBC. Quote, when I order you become guru, he becomes regular guru, that's all. He becomes disciple of my disciple, that's it, unquote. That, that was the conversation, all-important conversation, Prabhupada's personal quarters at Krishna Balaram in Raman Rethi, Vrindavan. Prabhupada would probably leave the scene soon as his physical body was utterly emaciated, hardly more than skin and bones. As such, some GBCs were in his room. They selected two of them of that, of the, of that group that was in his room to ask him two questions in relation to how initiations were to be conducted. One, how they were to be conducted while he was still with them. This was touched upon earlier in our presentation. And two, how initiations were to be conducted after he departed physical manifestation. That he would do so seemed imminent, and it turned out that it was imminent. He answered the first question by authorizing that the Ritvic system was to be reactivated. No surprise there. A few seconds later, he answered the second question by stating that if he recognized one of his disciples as regular guru, then that disciple would initiate new people into the Guru Parampara connection after Prabhupada left the scene. Let me tell you, the Ritviks hate this interpretation. It's the right interpretation, but they hate it to the max. They also hate the term regular guru because it completely dismantles their fanatical assertion that only an Uttama can initiate. An Uttama Adhikari is not a regular guru. Regular means under regulation. Even at the topmost level of Madhyam, the disciple is no longer under regulation, regular the principles, although he still follows them. Please note, Prabhupada destroys the Ritvic concoction in this excerpt from that important meeting with his leading secretaries, sannyasis, and presidents in late May 1977. Quote, disciple of my disciple, unquote, means that his disciple makes a new disciple who is the disciple of Prabhupada's disciple. This is basic logic. This is good logic. This accords perfectly with the Vedic and Vaishnava Tattva and Siddhanta. The bad logic of the Ritviks, which they use, contains all kinds of convoluted rationalizations in order to overcome what is as clear as a, as a bright sun on a cloudy, cloudless day. 
Prabhupada authorized the principle of regular guru. He did not name any of those regular gurus. And he obviously did not recognize a successor. If he had recognized a successor, that great devotee would not be in the category of a regular guru. And by the way, only some of you are going to catch this. If he had recognized a successor, that successor would not be dismissed as, quote unquote, the best of the lot either. And now we go to the fourth heavens. From a letter to a temple president dated April 26, 1968. Quote, a person who has liberated Acharya and Guru cannot commit any mistake, but there are persons who are less qualified or not liberated, but still can act as Guru and Acharya by strictly following the disciplic succession, unquote. This sentence shatters the imposition that only an Uttama can initiate. A Mahabhagavad is certainly a liberated devotee, Anyone who questions that has a hellish mentality. Acting as guru means acting as diksha guru. You cannot limit that to merely Vartma Pradarshaka or shiksha guru. Of course, some Ritviks will try to do that. Persons who are, quote, less qualified and not liberate indicates clearly the Madhim Adhikari, not the neophyte. Why? Because the added qualification of, quote-unquote, strictly following is also present in the statement. The monitor guru is a concession when there is the absence of a physically manifest spiritual master on the Uttama or highest platform. The guru from nature study, and by the way, that clause is specifically referred to a bit earlier in the letter, the guru from nature study can act as a guru. He can act as a spiritual master by carrying out the activities of the Acharya. The initiation he conducts is bona fide. Those initiations link the newcomer, generally a neophyte, to the Guru Parampara. After Narottama Das Thakur, that is how for many decades our line of disciplic succession remained intact and did not scatter. Once Vishwanath Chakravarti and Baladev Vidya Bhushana came along much later, there was once again a manifest Uttamadakari, but not in the time gap, not in the interim. Now, I've just presented four excerpts from Prabhupada. They've been described also by me in a commentary to some degree, some detail. These four excerpts shatter the Ritvik of the Siddhanta. These excerpts are all self-evident. Rationalizations cannot overcome the clear message that they convey. Please realize that all the Ritviks are low-rung neophytes. Many of them are Sahajyas, and some of them are almost certainly non-devotees. None of them are genuine because all of them are constantly breaking one of the four rules and regulations integral to advancement in spiritual and devotional life, namely mental speculation. All Ritviks are mental speculators. Realize them as such. Reject them as such. Mental speculation is a serious sin. No genuine transcendentalist in the personal line of yoga engages in it. The Ritviks are on the wrong side of history. They are on the side of quote-unquote Christianity as crypto-Christians. The Golden Age, we're in it, but when it finally blossoms, we'll, releg we'll relegate all of that crypto-Christianity into the dustbin of deservedly destroyed cheating religions where it belongs. Also realize that so-called ISKCON set the stage for this absurd rhythmic manifestation of hyperreality when it opened Pandora's box in the spring of 1978. So-called ISKCON does not escape culpability whatsoever. The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. 
Ritvik is only able to prosper at the current time because the original ISKCON movement was destroyed and replaced by so-called ISKCON over 40 years ago. It opened the door to such manifestations as these loose and ridiculous Ritvik movements. Feel free to condemn them now, for they fully deserve to be ridiculed to the max. Reality bites when hyperreality craters. No genuine transcendentalist will criticize you for pointing out the defects of the Ritvik concoction, and Jesus won't mind either. Sadeva Samyan.